This is the Shingu Park, which I took a few examples of. It's a quite big territory, 23,000 square kilometers. But for the Indians, they still feel the limits. They cannot expand their system. They cannot go beyond the borders. So um, a lot of the intensification of, I mean, the shortening of the fallow cycles so that you don't allow nature to regrow before you come back is based on too little space, too many people. And that is because a wide range of reasons. Somebody has stolen your land, government has taken it, but also on the positive side. Land recognition for ethnic groups is still a confined, definite territory. So you have to adapt to the territory you have, even in the best of circumstances. Also, internal logic changes. People need money now, so they have to grow cash crops. Cash crops uh, then put you on a sort of different logic than subsistence. Just to have enough to eat is relatively easy in the rainforest. To make money from it is a new challenge. But it is fully possible to integrate some cash crops into a traditional system, and it's done many places. In the old days, you moved your village. Now almost nobody moves their village anymore. Why? Because now you have a little school there. Now you maybe have a health station there. Now maybe there is a road going there to give you access to the market. So people get sedentarized. They stay in the same place. That changes the system. You cannot go eight hours to a field far away. In the old days you moved the village so the new field become close. But now villages are stable. And also the young people want more. They actually want their mobile phones and to have access to Facebook, even in the middle of the Amazon. Uh, and they want sunglasses and tennis shoes. So how to meet those challenges? Well, when space is limited, you have to go for some agroforestry system. You have to stay and cultivate in uh, the same plot over, a long, over many, many years. We in the Rainforest Foundation, Norway, supported that project, one of the first projects in Brazil, from 1991 to 2004. We started with a two hectare totally degraded plot in a rubber tapper area, using no external input, just putting leaves and branches on the soil, planting some trees, making shadow. And over these 14 years, production increased and increased and increased and increased because of crop rotation, some plants that fix nitrogen, etc. There's no time to go into that, but it's, it's fully possible with some extra work, with some extra work to make that work. You can meet monetary needs through the production of honey, spices, essences for cosmetics, etc. You see the honey from the Shingu. It's a huge demand. It's one of the best honeys in Brazil. They, uh, everything they produce, they sell immediately. Demand is much higher than uh, what they can deliver. But you cannot live only on honey and the income from Chile. Uh, there needs to be a government policy of rewarding those who protect the forest. There needs to be a kind of basic support. It's, I put payment in, I don't know what that's called. I mean, it's not really payment. It's rewarding the communities who maintain the forest and maintain the ecosystem services. There needs to be a basic government investment, sort of thanking those who protect the forest for continuing to maintain the forest. There needs to be a kind of social investments in school, in some support, etc. Doesn't have to be individual payment. But the system cannot continue in our century without some recognition. So here's just one exa example from the Chile, from the Baniwa Indians. Uh, they sell their pimenta, their chili. And it has become the highest fashion. There is not one top chef in Sao Paulo who doesn't use this now. Uh, and it's even sold in the, in the most expensive stores because that's marvelous chili. Uh, 
So you can find these opportunities, but you cannot only depend on them. So my recommendations, stop demonizing shifting cultivators. Acknowledge the rationality and benefits of the system, because it's a system that maintains forest landscapes, that is basic for maintaining cultural knowledge and adaptation. It's basic for these people not to go hungry, but to have food security. And work with the local communities so that they can develop the system, especially when that system is under stress for high population or lack of space, etc. It is fully possible to make very viable, innovative, productive system based on shifting cultivation with an addition. And respect these communities' customary and collective land rights. When we talk about rights-based systems, we are not talking about the individual right to the individual plot. That doesn't maintain a forest landscape. It is the customary view of a large space together the collective approach which protects the forest. And these people have a right to free, prior and informed consent when governments or NGOs or others want to have action in their territories. Collective rights protect forests and we want forests to be like this in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Lars. It was a very comprehensive presentation. This is also the kind of advocacy that indigenous peoples are doing in, in, in the context of climate change and climate change mitigations. So now I'd like to invite uh, Edward to give his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Edward Porokwa and I'm from uh, Pastoralist Indigenous uh, NGO Forum. And I'm going to present another very controversial contested uh, livelihood just like uh, shifting cultivation which is pastoralism and uh, looking at it in the context of uh, food security um, when, we, when we start talking about uh, and my case study is Tanzania so I'm going to do it in the context of Tanzania but it is very similar to what is happening in different parts of Africa and other places where uh, pastoralists uh, are working, uh, are existing. So indigenous people in Tanzania are primarily pastoralists and hunter-gatherers. For, uh, for that context, I will only present much about pastoralists. They are a community that are marginalized from the mainstream society. Their economy, or national, uh, their contribution to the national economy is not recognized. And uh, normally, uh, the government uh, say that they don't contribute to, to national economy. So always there's uh, attempts by government to uh, bring the so-called a more productive system than pastoralism, um, uh, to replace pastoralism, which is not quite understood by many, uh, many people. And uh, as a result of that uh, non-recognition of uh, their livelihood, they have a lot of characteristics related to forceful eviction, marginalization by, uh, and uh, in provision of uh, basic social services and many others. And uh, in most of the, ki of the time, there's a lot of land grab that is taking place. I can see a lot of similarity between what you are presenting in terms of uh, shifting cultivation and pastoralism and how uh, the governments and uh, probably even the international community try to displace that livelihood in the argument that it is not a productive system, it is archaic, it is uncivilized, it is uh, uh, a system that is not going to uh, exist in the current 20th century challenges, but forgetting that uh, it is a system that existed for a million years and that have uh, passed the test of time and uh, they, which have always been one that uh, can exist in the ecosystem that it is existing. It doesn't work. No, 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 no. Mm. Yeah, it is working now. 
Um, when we look at pastoralism, you can see that it employs multiple uh, some, uh, techniques in order to exist. And uh, among the techniques that pastoralism uses is uh, employing multiple head management techniques to buffer their losses in difficult time and ensure food security. And the, 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 in, in doing that, for example, the pastoralists in Tanzania uh, try to diversify the kind of livestock that they, they feed, uh, they, they keep in uh, like cattle, goats, and sheep to allow them to take maximum advantage of available resources in different uh, uh, ecological niche. So um, the goats can uh, be easily, they can, they can be able to get the grass in shorter grass and, uh, and even in, a, in a, using small trees and whatever, but livestock need taller grass. And um, those are the techniques that in the pastoralists use uh, to ensure that uh, they have uh, they buffer the losses in difficult time and ensure the food security in the areas. Um, if you look at what is trending now in the pastoralist areas, you can see that there's a lot of land grabbing uh, for farming, tourism, and investment investment that disrupt largely the livelihood of pastoral making food insecure. Um, there's a lot of uh, foreign and uh, local investment on land. Because one of the things that um, the similarity between pastoralism and the last presentation is that we, they use the land commonly. It is not the land that is owned by individuals. It is the land that is used by the community. And they, they move also. Mobility is a very important part of the pastoralism. It, and um, and that, is all, that is for different management uh, reasons. One is in order to, uh, to take advantage of different seasons that uh, are available in the areas. Secondly, in order to, um, to, 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 uh, to, to escape existence of diseases in different types of the year. And thirdly, in order to, uh, to, 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 to allow the ecosystem to regenerate. And um, the same thing happened as the last presentation that in so doing, when doing their mobility, it is, easily to say, it is easy to say that the land is vacant. And that is when other people are allocated to the land that pastoralists have, and as a result, um, lo lose their land and increase poverty and food insecurity to the community. Um, climate change is one of the issues that is affecting a, a pastoralist in Tanzania. And um, this is by, caused by increased variability of season, caused by long-term drought, leading to serious deaths of livestock, and decreased amount of grazing and water sources, and increase of livestock diseases. And this is due to the political inter policy interventions that are made by governments, not only in Tanzania, but different other governments, of forcing uh, pastoralists to stay in one place and refusing them access to their diverse resources. Uh, all the resources for livestock are not available in one location, they need uh, different resources. Salt lake is only available in some kind of areas. Uh, grass is available in a different ecosystem. Water is not available throughout the year in one area. And of course, because they live in, um, in the plains and also in forests, sometimes they use the forest to escape diseases caused by um, uh, wildlife. Because the wildlife is also using the same same they are using the same same techniques that uh, pastoralists are, or livestock are using, like in our area because we are bordering one of the big forests in uh, Tarangire National Park. Uh, there is a, I don't know whether any of you know the wild animal called wild beast. Yes, they are. We have a very big population of wild beast, and wild beast cause. Um, a serious disease to livestock called malignant cataract. <laughs> so the wild beast, when delivering from January uh, to March, they move into the plains to avoid the predators. So when they move into the plains where pastoralists are, the pastoralists have to move to the forest to avoid the disease caused by those animals. So the, 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 there's a close interrelationship between the wildlife themselves and the, and the, and the, and the, and the livestock and pastoralists. Uh, when this uh, 
uh, problem are coupled with a restricted life to, uh, livestock mobility and eviction, pastorally, this lead to food insecurity uh, to the pastoralist. Now, when you try to look at the general contribution of pastoralism to the national economy, which is not really captured by the, the government data, um, but some of the research has shown that uh, in Tanzania, for example, they constitute 15, around 15 household, which is 0.0% of the total household in Tanzania that practice pastoralism. And about 40% of the household of, uh, in Tanzania are both pastoralists and agriculturalists. The pastoralism contribute to their gross domestic product 45%, of which 30 or 13.5 of GDP was contributed by pastoralism. Pastoralism subsist wholly or in part upon animal. They make use of variable resources in dry land by using livestock to convert grasses and brosia into animal protein to be consumed by people. This is there's a very uh, famous research by Brat and, uh, and Gwyn which show all these things and how this scientifically pastoralism contribute to the protein that is consumed not only by pastoralists but the majority of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the population in Tanzania. And I, I haven't seen any, 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 any cow or cattle here in Lima, but I have eaten a lot of meat. So there's a very uh, close linkage between the uh, protein that you are consuming here in Lima and the production that is made by pastoralists elsewhere. I don't know what kind of livestock keeping you have here, but um, also, as I will say uh, later, um, in, uh, for example, uh, there, there are a lot of tested uh, uh, ways of making pastoralism sedentary by fencing areas, which has proved uh, really failure. Because it is, uh, we, in 1975, for example, in Tanzania, we have established different ranches and forced the pastoralists to live in ranches. As a result, we, ref we denied livestock to access the same ecosystem, that, wildlife to access the same ecosystem that they are using together with li uh, livestock. And at the same time, by, we built, uh, the government built some dams inside the ranches. But as a result, uh, really the, all the projects that were established through what they call Tanzania National Ranch in cooperation, NARCO, all the ranches have died and we have uh, uh, broken all the ranches and the pastoralists are continuing to live in that way but with a lot of these challenges coming in. Livestock have many roles in the pastoral society. They are um, the means of outcome production, the source of food, they are, they are used for commodity exchange. They are the source and objects of labor as value, and they are associated with uh, cultural and capital goods. But um, on this issue of labor, well, one of the things that we don't look at in the national data, I don't know here in Peru or in other parts of the world, is that the, 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 the amount of contribution of this system, and particularly pastoralism, in providing employment. More than 10% of Tanzanians are engaged in uh, pastoralism. But still, we don't see it as a contribution to that uh, sector. Ecosystem function and sustainability of the pastoral system is dependent upon availability of adequate land to distribute wet, uh, in wet and dry season the grazing pressure. You cannot keep all the livestock in one area. The, if you try to keep them, and that is how the, the ranching system failed in Tanzania. You brought all the li uh, livestock and put them in one ranching system. Definitely they will cause erosion. So you can only distribute and allow them to move from one place to another so that they consume the different resources which are not in abundance in one place in different parts, uh, in different uh, uh, seasons of the year. If the landscape become fragmented or in habitat uh, is lost, pastoral movement become restricted to a smaller area in which resources may be inadequate, unpredictable, and not diverse enough. Even in the ranches that we have established, we have killed some species of grass. We have just remained with a few 
uh, grass. So definitely that is uh, another issue that is uh, important to look at. Pastoral mobility allow pasture that have even grazed, uh, have been grazed to recover before they are needed again. Just like how he was presenting on the shifting cultivation, that um, when you leave that place, of which with the policymakers they think that is an empty land and that you have abandoned the land, it allow regeneration. Climate change is increasing. Uh, I think I'm, I'm told that I have uh, only two minutes. The changes in pastoral access to grazing land are occurring throughout Tanzania as a result of government policies, political boundaries. That is a very serious problem. Uh, land tenure changes including we are talking about protecting the land and creating a lot of conservation areas. In Tanzania, with 38% of the land of Tanzania is conservation area. And we try to separate conservation with people. And that is a very serious problem because they can, co they, uh, they can coexist and they have been coexisting for centuries. So it is possible to conserve and at the same time people use the same same resources that are, is available for them. Life, livelihood diversification. That is another um, change that is taking place. There's an increased agriculture among pastoralists themselves because of the constraint that they get in staying in one place and uh, resulting into a serious problem with the community. Traditional social network and institution may break down as a community become less involved in decision making regarding land management and decision making. That is what is happening. Now we, we give a lot of powers to the government. The government see also an opportunity to use the land and get money for the national treasury so they get into agreement with foreigners and uh, different com uh, companies and the people get less and less involved in management of the natural resources. Population growth also interact with these changes to impact on the per capita land base. So climate change is a reality, but at the same time, it is more serious for indigenous people because of all these challenges that we can see above. The concept is, uh, of uh, uh, pastoralism is really not uh, uh, supported by many decision makers. Extensive, extensive views of landscape for pastoralism is crucial to accessing widespread but necessary resources for an equilibrium of the system. The equilibrium of the, of the system depends on how you manage and use the resources that is available. The need for pastoralism for land grazing area is complementary with the need for many wild engulfed. I, I think I mentioned about that point. That the other animals also need the same same land that we are using. Changes in less, less, uh, landscape structure may also make this more susceptible to extreme events. Um, in, uh, my in, my life, uh, in my last slide, you can see also that the spatial isolation of grazing system limits the ability of the people, both to and domestic animal to exploit heterogeneity and vegetation. And this is another study that has proved that if you limit the use of the people and, uh, uh, and grazing in ecosystem, you limit the ability of the people and wild, um, uh, wild and domestic animal to exploit the resources. Uh, cultivation may affect the accessibility of and uh, availability of two resources is semi-arid landscape because we are also bordering the semi-arid areas. So if you allow agriculture so much in an area that people need to go from the forest to the plain from time to time because they need both the forest and the, and the plain, you will uh, definitely kill uh, the, the habitat. Loss of habitat to alternative land uses poses a risk of both domestic and wildlife species. And um, I think I have used more than the time I'm supposed to use. And thank you very much. Um, okay. Thank you, Edward, for presenting the realities from Tanzania. So now we'd like to move to EE e. uh, from Myanmar. Thank you very much for uh, 
having a chance like this to present about our country and shifting cultivation. Uh, I, my presentation will be more focused on the social aspect of the current uh, shifting cultivation system of our indigenous people in Myanmar. The first. Uh, just to introduce, because I met some people who don't know Myanmar yet. Where is it? So this is Myanmar. <laughs> and the background on shifting cultivation uh, in our country, we call it Shui Biang Dao Ya. It's a town, uh, is hill, and Ya is farm. So it's a kind of, Shui Biang is shifting. So it's a kind of uh, shifting hill farm. Um, mostly, we can see in Kachin Kaya, Kayin Chin, and Shan State, all of them are ethnic minority who of Myanmar. So estimated there is 15,000 hectares per year. According to the recent red roadmap, they estimate the um, hectare of shifting cultivation area in the country. And it is the total land, 22.8% uh, of the total land area of the country and 15% of the forest area because 40% uh, of the country land area is forest area. Out of that, 15% is shifting cultivation area. Fellow period is ranging from zero to seven years because there are some area that has very limited land that they cannot rotate any longer. And there are still some area of practice seven year. Actually, in the past, it used to be 10 to 12 year of uh, fellow period. And one tenth of population relying on shifting cultivation according to the 2004 data. Actually, if we look at to 1988, in the, it is uh, one ten is half in 2004. So it, it's used to be two ten of population relying on shifting cultivation in the past in the country. And it's reduced year by year with the more land gra grabbing and all the social issues coming up and limited er uh, land area also from the government initiative on uh, eradication of those shifting cultivation land area in the country. Government policy in terms of, so generally all type of land belong to the state. We have, uh, all the land can be grabbed anytime according <laughs> to this law. So most of the people in the country, uh, the nationality, they, they have used right for land but do not own the land. Although we might have like land tenure or a kind of uh, document, they are not valid actually according to the uh, current uh, until now, no, uh, the land law. So, um, so they mention like pioneer or unsustainable shifting cultivation are listed as the main driver of forest degradation. Although we still have a lot of illegal logging going on in the country for deforestation as well. And according to Myanmar Forest Policy 1995, they mentioned that. Uh, they, uh, to, they mentioned shifting cultivation to discourage it practices causing extensive damage to the forest through adoption of a improved practices for better fruit production and a better quality of life for shifting cultivator is what they plan. So one more thing along uh, with this is 1992 Land Use Act. They, Actually, most of the shifting cultivation land are categorized under the wasteland. We have 10 types of land in the country, and shifting cultivation land is under wasteland and vacant land. That's why in that wasteland and vacant land, um, they can, the government, because it's mentioned as vacant land, the government said that any private sector who want to get the land to replenish it or to, repl to do replantation, they can come and uh, apply for it. They give 5,000 acres. 5,000 acres will be around 2,500 hectares per private sector if they want to apply and they can get ownership up to 30 years. So there are many uh, private sector who grab the land with this vacant land law, but doing nothing just to wait for the good time to sell it with a better price. And the gaps in the law, we have as, actually our shifting cultivation should be under the farm law, but it's not categorized under that. And 
in the farm law, farmland law, customary land tenure is not recognized. So, and specifically, communal collective tenure is not allowed under the law, and rotational agricultural system, shitting cultivation is not recognized as a legal land use under the law. Land cannot be registered for shifting cultivator. And another one, vacant failure and virgin land law. In that as well, grazing and forest land cannot be communally tighter, and no independent legal redress in case of conflicts. It's very strong law. <laughs> so, we, for us, one thing is we have very weak research done. In the past, to do research is very risky. We are not allowed. So just recently, we come up with some social research, and we need more research for the country for sure. And the case study one that we study is in Baguyoma, current people uh, region. I'm also Karen, and it is two community and in the Nutland Township of Wagbo, and um, estimated household of this two community is 100 household. Actually, they used to be one community together, but the, because of they have limited land, some family moved to a deeper forest, but wherever they moved, the illegal logger also followed them. <laughs> so, um, so actually, it's very far trip uh, from Yangon to five hour by bus, two hour by motorbike, and two hour walking. And another community is five hour walking. There is no car can go apart from the local car. So sometimes the villagers also have to rely for transportation to the local's car passing by to go to the city. And it is uh, this community is one thing. Interesting is they still use butter economy. Sometimes they produce chili, they exchange with the rice nearby community. And sometimes people from the city, they bring rice and go to that community to get their product because their product is really fertile and really good product. So their main crop is chili, sesame, cotton for exchange and also paddy, tomato. So paddy and corn are for family consumption, and also they grow like tomato eggplants for consumption as well. So in this area, they still have five to seven fellow period reduced from 10 to 12 because they have limited land. Uh, they cannot speak Burmese language, and they don't know how to communicate with illegal logger when the logger come and grab their land and cutting down the tree and things like that. So they even have to ask someone who can speak Burmese to go and talk to those company, and they cannot differentiate between those are legal or illegal logger because anybody coming in and they have limited knowledge on how to uh, know who are doing what. So they are like very vulnerable. And then, um, actually during the British colony, they are allowed to do shifting cultivation. And they, by doing shifting cultivation, the British uh, colony time, they are asked to plant teak as well. So you plant teak and you do shifting cultivation, you are given permission to some extent like that. Uh, animal husbandry they are doing. And in time of, um, uh, actually there are some smuggling of things going on as well. They have a lot of turtle, and the turtle eggs are come and collected by the broker in their area. Sometimes when they have farming or some problem, they collect those turtle eggs to sell it. Actually, uh, to some extent, there are Chinese market to, because we are bordering to China as well, so uh, it's going on, and also orchid are also collected to, uh, for sale as well. They also suffer from climate change a lot, and one of them is rat infestation. Uh, like every time in the past, is every 50 year, the bamboo flower uh, grow, and at that time there are a lot of mice and just run all their farmland. It's happened only 50 year one time, but he now become more and more frequent. So the way they solve the problem is they have a kind of. Uh, Roots, so, so in, because all their crops are just right, they eat those root and um, uh, uh, those roots and yam seed for food when they have that those kind of certain disaster, and they also have wild pig who come and eat the uh, bamboo flower, and at the same time they got meat 
because they uh, catch the wild pig who come and eat those flower. And also they bring more and more cats in, in that time to eat mice. And they themselves also trap, use the trap, and they also collectively hunt those uh, rats to solve the problem. And in time of, like that time, they also go and collect orchid to exchange rice because their crops are just right. And in the past, they have to, 600 yard is like half dollar for tax. Um, uh, for tax to um, do shift and cultivation nowadays with the 1992 land law they don't need to pay any tax and also they don't own any land. So this is the photo, the way they solve the problem of rats. Actually, they make the rats dry and eat it. So in the, and those seeds they collect. <laughs> Maybe you will not be, you will be afraid to eat, no? <laughs> so they, they eat it, it's their way of solving problem. And another community, it is Thailand of Chin people. Chin people, Thai is one of the ethnic group of Chin people, Chin ethnic minority group, so it's a one dialect. So we look at to the five villages in the township of Kampelet, and there's also more than 100 households we look at to and ask many questions about uh, poverty, how, how, because in this area, fellow period is very shortened, and we find out what is the reason and what they are, they are facing in terms of food security and livelihood security. So their area is very far, Chin State, and 24 hours on food, uh, and very transportation is very bad. So there is one uh, community leader mentioned to me that we thanks to the logger who come to our community because they also uh, prepare the land along with logging <laughs> because they have very bad road. So um, actually it's not, um, it's not what they want, but they have no other choice to get better transportation, things like that. And their main crop is ripe corn, pickled tree leaves, sweet potato, potato eggplant, tomato chili, similar to former one. And they also do hunting because the, their area has a lot of wild animal, and gisat, tiger, wild pig, rabbit, wolf, and butterfly. Butterfly is sometimes, there is a market for that people come and ask for them to catch butterfly. So they are like those, um, when the community don't know anything, people come and show certain species that we want to buy this price, this price. So they, they sometimes uh, connected to that kind of thing. And they also are near to the river, so they do fishing seasonally. So there are very low periods because of population increase and also limited land available become like one to three years. So um, however, Compared to the former community, they have stronger customary practice. So the community leader decide who will get the land for what year, so that all the community will equally get better land next year. Uh, uh, um, not uh, so they, they divide like equally, so that all get rotated in different way. And um, there are high rate of migration in that area for better education or also become refugees for many reasons along with the country civil war and saturation. So they, they also have selling and plantation of EMC, five to six USD per visit is a lot of money for them. And family income per man, actually the first fam uh, community, they don't have that money, but the second community, they earn like per month 20 to 50 USD. So actually, uh, so according to the government, the causes of, the government also acknowledged some of the causes of uh, unstable or pioneering shifting cultivation. Uh, in the red roadmap, they identify as shortening fellow period and reduced practices due to many reasons. Loss of traditional land due to investment, hydropower agricultural, growing population, lack of land tenure over shifting cultivation land and surrounding forests, lack of viable alternative to shifting cultivation and acceptable technology or practices to improve or diversify slash and burn agricultural. So our country is now ongoing this 
consultation for national land use policy because there are a lot of land issue going to National Human Rights Commission. So from this national land use policy, they plan to go up to national land law, which include in that policy as they will consider again of those uh, those um, land tenure for ethnic minority. Uh, however, we need to work hard so that it is really um, improving um, the social life of the uh, indigenous people in Myanmar. So my key recommendation, actually, I would like to say that the previous key recommendation from uh, others are really good. So, so my key recommendation will be the previous one plus <laughs> more research and documentation on shifting cultivation and related study for our community, acknowledgement land tenure for sustainable shifting cultivator, and support services for indigenous people to enhance their livelihood, capacity building on innovation, especially for women and youth scale on agroforestry, native forest product, and also biodiversity conservation and enhancement and protection against biopiracy and unfair and illegal per Tenting. Thank you very much. Thank you, EE. E. Now we move to the final presentation. Number five. Uh. Okay. Do you want to click for me? Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're shifting now to from local to international. My name is Susan Bratz, and I work for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Um, there is a very strong international framework to support indigenous, indigenous peoples' rights. Um, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People uh, provide a framework of, um, of legal or a legal framework for rights. Um, there's also a very powerful uh, forum for discussion with a permanent for forum on indigenous issues um, out, of, out of the UN. So what I will talk about today is how do we translate this very strong support for indigenous people at international level to support for national level and then action on the ground. Next one. Um, so just very quickly, so an overview, um, global overview of indigenous people. Uh, there's an estimated 370 million indigenous people spread across 70 countries worldwide. Although 5% of the world's total population um, consists of indigenous people, it's also um, a population that's poor. So an estimated 15% of indigenous people are poor, uh, uh, sorry, 15% of the global population um, is, uh, okay, 15% of the global poor are indigenous people. We know and we've heard some wonderful examples today. They're holders of unique languages, knowledge systems, and beliefs. And the, this is invaluable for, um, for sustainable management of natural resources and food security. We've also heard today the special relation between the people and their lands and territories and resources. Um, and it's of fundamental importance for their collective, collective physical and cultural survival as people. Um, there are diverse concepts of development um, among indigenous people based upon traditional values, visions, needs, and priorities. Now that leads us to um, the main issues and challenges, many of which we've talked about today, which is lack of political representation and participation of indigenous people in national forum and decision making. Um, economic marginalization and poverty and lack of access to social services and also discrimination. Now, there are a number of core principles that indigenous rep uh, representatives have um, brought forth to international um, discussions on indigenous people. And these are then reflected in the UN Declaration on Indigenous Rights. Um, th these core principles are self-determination, development with identity, free prior and informed consent, which is fundamental, participation and inclusion, the rights over the land and natural resources, all of which you've talked about today. Cultural rights, 
collective rights um, and collective management of collective uh, land resources, and also gender equality. Now I'm turning to um, what FAO has been doing to help translate these strong principles that are enshrined in international law um, to support uh, countries and people in country to um, actually actualize these, these principles. Um, FAO uh, prepared a policy on indigenous and tribal peoples in 2010. Now, that lays out the rationale for work with indigenous people, um, the global context, and also the different uh, priority areas in which FAO will work. And these are listed here. So we've got natural resources, environment, and genetic resources. Uh, support for climate change, bioenergy, land and territories, food security and nutrition, and the right to food, communication and knowledge systems, culture and biological diversity, and economic opportunity for sustainable livelihoods. So in other words, FAO is saying these are the areas in, in which we um, will support work, um, our work in countries, and also at international level. We work through a number of different means, um, both raising awareness of indigenous people issues, helping to support capacity development, including th through development of tools that would be useful for, um, for use, and then support, direct support to countries through our field program. Um, we also work in, in partnership with others, and we work to strengthen partnerships so that um, together these issues can be addressed. Now, um, in, uh, well, FAO has developed um, a set of, of guidelines on tenure, um, and we've heard today about the, the critical importance of tenure, tenure issues for indigenous people. Um, so, we worked, um, oops, yeah. Um, so we worked to develop a, a set of guidelines, um, and it's an impossibly long title, which we can never, ever remember. So we just call it the Voluntary Guidelines. Um, the full title is the Voluntary Guidelines on the Responsible gover Governance of Tenure of Land, Fisheries, and Forests in the context of national food security. Now, this is a set of guidelines that has been adopted by 124 countries under the, um, the Commission on World Food Security. Um, as well as a number of, of uh, stakeholders, non-governmental stakeholders that work in this commission. This is a, is a governing body of FAO, and it basically sets out um, a soft law for tenure that these 124 countries have, have um, aligned themselves to. So this is the first set um, of legal guidance on land tenure, and land tenure and resource tenure. So f adopted across these, these different stakeholders, countries and stakeholders. Um, there is one section of the voluntary guidelines that deals specifically with indigenous people. And so the key principles of those are aligned to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, as well as the CBD standards on um, uh, free prior and informed, or, sorry, CBD standards on um, indigenous people. And it basically um, uh, supports the call for recognizing, protecting, promoting, and implement, implementing people's rights. These guidelines also call upon states and other parties uh, to hold in good faith consultation with indigenous peoples before initiating any project or measures affecting the resources for which they hold rights. And that's all in line with free prior and informed consent. The guidelines recognize the right for self-determination and self-governance of tenure. It also, they also say that states should recognize and protect the legitimate tenure rights of indigenous people and consider adapting their policy, legal, and organizational frameworks to recognize tenure systems of indigenous people. We've, this morning we've had some great examples of how there are perverse policy incentives or perverse policies in government that actually work against the rights of indigenous people. 
And then another key um, element of these guidelines is to encourage participation of indigenous peoples in the development of laws and policies related to their tenure systems. It calls for the assistance to, go to communities to increase the capacity of their members to participate fully in decision making and governance of their tenure systems. Next slide. So what we are doing is to help translate those um, principles that are laid out, laid out in the, the, um, um, these guidelines to work on the ground. So we're working with various countries um, in developing national workshops that look at these guidelines in the national context. And those include indigenous people's representatives that are interacting with other stakeholder groups uh, to analyze the main issues related to, to land tenure in the countries. We're also under, undergoing a study on the assessment of the voluntary guidelines and their relevance and usefulness for indigenous people. So taking those elements in the guidelines and then saying, okay, how does it actually translate into indigenous people's needs on the ground? And we're collecting um, examples of the implementation of the voluntary guidelines in countries. Um, we're also um, working on a governance uh, or a guide to help translate these principles um, in the voluntary guidelines to actions on the ground in countries. And so it's taking broad principles and then applying those to national circumstances. And then also with AIPP, um, there are the development of seven case studies on shifting cultivation, livelihood, and food security. Um, this summer in August um, in, uh, in Asia, there was a workshop to look at these, um, at the, the case studies. We're also developing technical guidelines um, that are relevant for indigenous people. So here are some examples governing land, for women and men, so the gender issues um, in, uh, related to indigenous people. Um, we also have one in improving governance of forest tenure, and then also um, some guidance on, on the respecting free prior and informed consent. Um, also underway is a technical guide on pastoral, pastoralism and rangelands. So here, two colleagues who are working um, very much with indigenous people. I work more on the margins of indigenous people, but they are, they've, uh, they're in a group that deals specifically with these issues, and they're working with the departments on developing uh, these guidance tools. Now, just to close, um, I want to highlight just three challenges and recommendations. First is strengthening capacity at national level to implement these voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure, these voluntary guidelines. Um, and to um, basically to strengthen the capacity to implement these, so to take these from international level and provide a means to, to implement them on the ground, respecting indigenous rights and uh, customary tenure systems. The second recommendation is that government agencies need to adopt policies and practices that respect and protect the uh, free prior and informed consent. And civil society organizations, land, user, land users, and private investors globally must comply with their responsibilities in relation to FPIC. This has been internationally accepted, adopted, and now the challenge is to, to actually actualize that on the ground. And then lastly, all stakeholders need to continue to work to raise awareness that indigenous knowledge and traditional practices are assets rather than barriers to efforts to achieve universal food security. So we need to turn the whole thinking around and the discourse around from seeing indigenous people as hindering to actually as a very valuable source of knowledge and expertise that will help meet the global challenges of food security and environmental sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. We have just five minutes left, so we'll just limit to three questions. We'll just go for the first round. Okay, one, two, three. Please introduce yourself and the questions you want to refer to. 
Good morning, and thank you for a very interesting panel. My name is Barbara Fraser. I'm, I'm a journalist. And I'd like to ask, in places where you've, um, where there have, there's been successful implementation of alternative production that is based on local pro local products and doesn't require traditional agriculture, where you're using the the one in Brazil comes to mind. How do you go about implementing those things and building the capacity for people to actually use the, identify the products, produce um, high quality products, and be able to get them to market? Next question. Muy buenos días. Entre todo, mis felicitaciones por las interesantes exposiciones. Este, eh, mi pregunta va para la, la representante de Perú, es Tarsila Rivera, y para el representante de Tanzania. Es respecto a si las experiencias que se han mostrado han eh, venido siendo complementadas con algunas actividades de eh, conservación de suelos. Como Tarsile debe saber muy bien, en la Sierra del Perú el problema de erosión de suelos es bastante, bastante importante ¿no? y requiere ser priorizado dentro de todas aquellas prácticas de conservación y producción. Y si en especial estamos conservando recursos nativos, es muy importante también que estas actividades estén siendo complementadas o llevadas a cabo en ello. En lo que respecta a Tanzania, igualmente, ¿no? la preocupación es en cuanto a hasta qué niveles se viene controlando, supervisando o fiscalizando el evitar que estas tierras en los sistemas pastoriles o de pastoralismo sean llevados a un nivel de degradación. ¿Qué políticas o qué manejo tradicional es el que estas comunidades vienen implementando? Muchas gracias. What's the next? Three. Buenos días. Eh, tengo un par de preguntas. Eh, soy Ramsey de Perú. Trabajo en Libélula. Um, primero, sobre shifting cultivation eh, o quema y rosa. En el caso de Perú, eh, uno de los problemas más, uno de los drivers más, impo más importantes de la deforestación es la agricultura migratoria eh, y normalmente se da debido a la migración de los Andes hacia, hacia la selva. Eh, hay un problema de entendimiento de conceptos también. Eh, yo entiendo que esto del quema y rosa que ocurre en la selva no es lo mismo que la agricultura migratoria que viene de los Andes. Quisiera que me confirmen eso. Y también, si es que la, ese shifting cultivation aparece en los mapas de deforestación a través de remote sensing, del de la, la, sens, sensorío eh, remoto. Eh, esa es mi primera pregunta. Y la segunda pregunta es sobre el esquema de eh, eh, access and benefit sharing sobre qué es justamente el acceso y repartición de beneficios del de, de uso de conocimientos tradicionales y de recursos genéticos. Yo hice un trabajo sobre esto, pero fue muy descritorio y quería saber su opinión sobre si este esquema de Access and Benefit Sharing podría ser una oportunidad para el diálogo intercultural o si más bien la introducción de valores de mercado podrían dañar la um, dañar las, los sistemas de reciprocidad y de, compa de, de compartir que ya ocurren en las comunidades indígenas. Eso es todo. Thank you. Um, 
I think the, uh, the first question was definitely to me how to identify um, products with potential market um, value and how to ensure that uh, these products are actually high quality, satisfy market requirements and all that stuff. And uh, first let me say that there has been an enormous amount of so-called economic alternative projects that have failed. So it's not easy. At the same time, uh, in Rainforest Foundation Norway and in our colleagues, we also have a series of experiments and tests which have been successful. Um, so uh, you need to work with the groups, and I think that's the essence, that's the first lesson. Governments and NGOs cannot just leave it to them. I mean, you must work with the people. They don't have market special knowledge. They don't really know the markets. All systems have hygienic requirements. Uh, you cannot just sell anything. Well, you can on the local market, but you cannot, like in Sao Paulo, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we have seen, for instance, in the Xingu Park in Brazil that uh, honey, uh, is very easy to adapt to a kind of traditional lifestyle. You don't have to watch the bees every day. I mean, you can leave it to the bees for a while and then you can, you know, collect the honey. You need to invest in hygienic conditions. You need this, you know, you need to have uh, uh, sterile glasses uh, to put the honey on. You need, you know, labels. There's a whole process of training to understand the market. At the same time, this honey became the second ecologically certified honey in Brazil. Uh, and it is made in the middle of a huge territory where there is like kilometers and kilometers from any pesticides. I mean, it, it, it's, it's really, really uh, both ecological and extremely good which is why it can sell for very good prices on the market, and if they were willing to produce more. But these Indians are not capitalists. So they eat half of the honey, and they don't produce more than they think is okay. So for a capitalist, this is a crazy approach, because they could have sold 10 times more, relatively easily, if they were willing to spend more time in dealing with the bees and the honey. Okay. Uh, the same goes to some extent for the Chile example. Uh, in Xingu, there has been identified a series of palm oils and other vegetable oils that are of interest to the cosmetics industry. Some negotiations failed. The Indians didn't get what they wanted, so they didn't want to sell. So they, there is no business. At the same time, in other areas, even with traditional products like rubber, natural rubber has a low price. But our partners in Brazil have been able to get some companies to pay an extra price and to market that this rubber comes from well-protected areas managed by uh, rubber tappers and extractivists. So the companies have also been willing to give an extra premium on traditional products. You have to work on an understanding of the market and the producer in order to also achieve this kind of extra value linked to maintaining forest and ecosystem services. So it is a long-term investment, many years investment, in finding the products, refining the production cycle, and getting it to the market. And some of that will fail. The colonos coming down from the Andes and clearing forests for annual uh, repetitive production of maize and manioc and so on is not shifting cultivation. It is contributing to deforestation and it's a huge problem. And also we work in Congo. And if you see the satellite maps of Congo and if you see the, the Congo analysis of drivers of deforestation, the government has identified shifting cultivation as a main driver of of deforestation. We don't agree with that analysis, not especially, especially not for the future. But of course, shifting cultivation temporarily also has mean, means non-forest. 
But in the traditional cycle, that is a temporary approach. But with increasing population, the problem increases. This is obvious. I cannot uh, probably not do more. Access and benefit sharing. Personally, I believe uh, that there is a potential there. We have seen very few cases in the real world. Uh, but I don't see a problem in recognizing and paying for knowledge, even it is for coming from a system which was originally non-market-based. Muchas gracias. Eh, yo voy a responder a una primera pregunta de la hermana Fraser en relación al, a las experiencias. En el caso nuestro, eh, con la población que retorna después de casi 15 años fuera de la comunidad, eh, quisiera que se tome en cuenta que el salir y conocer otras experiencias también nos da un valor agregado. Por ejemplo, venimos de una comunidad donde no, no había fruta, pero descubrimos que la palta tenía mucho nutriente para la, para la comunidad y entonces introdujimos la palta en la comunidad y se adapta perfectamente, hecho por la misma gente de la comunidad que ya había comido palta afuera. Entonces, eso es una, una experiencia concreta que responde a la necesidad de otros nutrientes. En el caso nuestro, todo lo hacemos desde la comunidad, con la comunidad, para la comunidad, principalmente recuperando conocimientos apropiados. La, la otra pregunta en relación a conservación de suelos, eh, justamente el, la calidad del suelo y el agua son lo más importante en la parte andina y dependemos de la lluvia y del agua dulce que la naturaleza nos da porque no hay otra. Entonces, por eso usamos los abonos naturales recuperados del propio conocimiento. Por ejemplo, ¿cómo podríamos imaginar que chancar la penca de la tuna, eh, mezclarlo con el rocoto que es tan picante, sirve para matar los gusanitos que se comen eh, la, la, la plantación en flor? Pero eso es un conocimiento propio y tratamos de no usar de ninguna manera los, eh, los abonos o, eh, o pesticidas que dañan la tierra y ese es otro problema. ¿no? El, el tema del, de la agricultura migratoria, personalmente... Como activista de derechos de pueblos indígenas, mucho tiempo estuve con sentimiento de culpa porque los andinos, huyendo de la violencia, fuimos a dar a la parte amazónica de nuestras regiones, como en el caso de Ayacucho, a la parte de la selva con los ashanincas. Eh, sin embargo, a través del tiempo podemos ver cómo se ha dado una relación intercultural entre nosotros. Cuando una hermana Ashaninka, que antes se podía trasladar de un lugar a otro con su familia para comer, sea animales de bosque o peces de río o los gusanitos del árbol, ahora no tiene a dónde ir. Y saben que su testimonio es que ha aprendido cosas eh, que son aplicables ahora para ella. Por ejemplo, criar animales menores eh, en la casa y luego aprender a cocinarlos combinando con su propio conocimiento y que eso le genere economía para la educación de sus hijos. Eh, son experiencias que se dan a lo largo del tiempo, pero es verdad. O sea, aquí... También el racismo y la discriminación hizo que los andinos y los amazónicos no nos conozcamos, no nos respetemos y, se, y reproduzcamos esa, ese racismo y discriminación que, que hay en nuestro país. ¿no? Entonces, pero hay experiencias positivas y creemos que en el plano de derechos todavía tenemos mucho que trabajar para poder reconocernos como tales, ¿no? en, en un medio donde las diferencias no nos separen, sino nos puedan apoyar a construir. 
en la repartición de beneficios, eh, yo también soy de la corriente que estamos discutiendo en un sistema de mercado y que más bien nuestros conocimientos y nuestra cosmovisión y práctica de la, del compartir no puede convertirse en un, en un sistema para que el otro se siga apropiando gratuitamente de nuestros conocimientos. Entonces sí creemos que los conocimientos y los aportes que damos desde este sistema debería reconocerse. Actualmente no hay experiencia, al menos que yo conozca, que se esté en la práctica reconociendo económicamente y distribuyéndose los conocimientos. Por ejemplo, ayer en la conferencia de prensa nos hizo la entrevista la revista Xingu de la China. Yo le dije que no estamos de acuerdo con la biopiratería y que el Estado tiene la responsabilidad de, de defender y de hacer respetar frente a terceros toda esa maravilla que tenemos para todos, intercambiado en un sistema equitativo. Y saben que como, como China se llevó la maca y ha puesto cuarenta y tantos mil hectáreas de maca, entonces no pone nada de esto en la revista. Entonces, eh, hay mucho que discutir y paso el micro a alguno de ustedes. Uh, just a short one. I think it is very important to protect the indigenous um, plants and seed because there is a big uh, uh, market, black market in our country that Uh, they are not, without realizing the bamboo seeds are come and buy with very cheap price, uh, cheap price, um, and also the hobble, uh, very precious hobble, are also come and buy with very cheap price. For them, they just don't know, but after a long, after a certain period of time, they realize that uh, they already have lost their uh, Uh, indigenous seeds and uh, plants in their area, so they started worry and they would like to protect and they don't know how. And I, that's in that reason, uh, I think it is very important for biodiversity conservation as well to protect the uh, indigenous seeds and plants for indigenous people. Thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, I would like to interrupt because uh, it's almost a time for other side events, so I would like to stop here. But then before we end, uh, I would like to request all the participants here because we have seen the, uh, the different examples of indigenous people's practices in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. So the issue of the that it is being discussed also in the climate change is about land rights. That, that will also be into the land we discuss. And so I would like to request to also put, take these cases into account and also try to support the indigenous people's issues into the land we discuss and that is being taken place in the climate change negotiations. With that, I would like to thank our panel speakers and all the participants who have patiently waited for so long and that we had a very good interaction. But then you can personally approach our speakers if you have other questions. Thank you very much.